gentlemen. Welcome back to the shop today. A treat especial from the Big Rock Canyon Mountain. The subject deer. And near to my fart, scratch and sniff the finger what? 100%. Prime grade trinesium. Got the day old brisk special half off. 73 doll hairs this thing cost me. But what is it? A variable displacement vein pump hydraulic now i hear you what is my major affliction with the hydraulic is it the hot gushing oil dripping down the back of my neck that gets me no it is plainly not that it's the fact that hydraulics are so torque dense they're so power dense you can take a big old hydra a big old electric motor uh, what would run probably 15 20 30 horsepower you know big cork stuffer stick it to this guy stick some little tiny lines to a very compact unit and get incredible bone shattering earth crushing rock smashing torque out of a unit this big in the palm of your mitt as you may well be aware this ain't my first kick to cat on the hydraulic side we've had a look at the ubiquitous and cheap gear pump uh dumb dumb control and we've also had a look at a very expensive very dear piston pump with uh, pressure compensating and torque limiting and all sorts of valving in there in betwixt the between of the two of those is this variable displacement vein pump now the gear pump it's dumb you turn it it puts out a certain amount of flow the thing is, when you first get into hydraulics, you oh, everyone makes the same mistake that pumps create pressure. Pumps do not create pressure. It is a restriction to flow what creates pressure. Okay, so pumps create flow. Now, the variable displacement piston pump is very interesting because it's like a six shooter and it's got a swash plate. And depending on how far over that swash plate is, you get more or less flow. So that's an interesting feature because then you can backfeed a signal into a servo. Now a servo is a motor with a control loop. That's all it means, whether it's electric or hydraulic or whatever. It's a motor that has in a control loop built into it. So in the variable piston pump, you have a control loop that is called a compensator. That compensator is reading the outlet pressure and changing the swash plate angle. But what the pump compensator does, and this is fucking brilliant, it controls the flow by monitoring the pressure on the outlet side. So you have a hydraulic cylinder and it is lifting a weight. In order to lift that weight, you need a certain pressure. So the pump starts pumping oil into that, that piston, that hydraulic cylinder and the piston rises the weight up. It lifts the weight up. Now, you need a certain amount of pressure in order to do that, say 1,000 PSI. At the end of stroke, when the piston cannot move anymore, now it's bottomed out. The pump is still pumping oil in. Say it's a gear pump. The pump is still pumping oil in. Now the pressure spikes because the oil can't go anywhere. There's ultimate restriction to flow. Now that pressure would go through the roof until something physically broke more than likely a hydraulic line or the pump seal itself would just blow up and i have i've had that happen in my hand and it's not very fun so on a dumb gear pump what you need is a relief valve and a relief valve limits the maximum system pressure so once it reaches whatever the relief valve is set at say 5000 psi the relief valve opens up and allows excess fluid to go back to tank and the tank is at zero pressure that's a great safety feature but there's also a problem with that because now you have the pump under full load i got something buzzing here i gotta go check it out i don't know what that was likely some assholes into his wife's bedside table fired up the tooth chipper so what was i saying about uh, pressure comp oh yeah relief valve okay there's a problem inherent in relief valves in that all of the power that's going into the pump now it's full flow full pressure that means it's at 100 percent load the electric motor or the prime mover diesel motor or whatever's coupled to it that is the prime mover providing the impetus to turn the pump shaft that's putting a lot of energy into the system and that's all going over the relief so you're 
pressurizing this fluid and then dumping all the pressure off. That relief valve gets screaming hot, heats up the oil as it's, as it's going over. So it turns in a, in a gear pump. Going over the relief valve turns the system into one big heater. Okay, say you got a 50 horsepower heater in 20 gallons of oil. That oil gets hot fast and hot oil turns to smoke and flame in a hurry. So between the very smart control of the radial piston or axial piston pump or radial piston pump, it doesn't matter, the very smart control of pressure compensated um, and the very cheap gear pump that is dumb as a post, you have this guy and it is pressure compensated, but it's a vein pump. So what you can do is you put this into the system and instead of when you bottom out an implement, it's screaming over the relief, the compensator reads the pressure on the output and when it overcomes the spring tension, it moves over, well actually, as, it's, as the pressure comes up, it's continually moving over. Moving, what it's moving is it's moving the vein ring, the outer ring. Let's see if we can knock this compensator out. And these are all casting steel, ca uh, ductile iron castings. So there'll be nodules of graphite in there. Very good material for hydraulics and valving because it's self-lubricating. In addition to the oil in there, the graphite nodules provide excellent uh, wear resistance. So it's an excellent material for pumps. Far, far better than an aluminum casting. And you'll you'll only ever see super cheap gear pumps that are uh, aluminum casting because anything with valving is far better off with a cast ductile iron. And we see an interesting artifact of the manufacturer here, a load sense line. Now, so this casting is good for different uh, models of pump, but what we actually have here is a displacement limiter. So this guy limits the displacement of the external ring. You'll see all this, it'll be plain as day. Very, very smart because it's so simple. Now, one of the drawbacks of using Chinesium as, a, as an industrial metal, we can see quite plainly here, the assembly is not that great. We got a blown out O-ring. Now, I ain't knocking Chinesium. It is what it is. It's, it's not named after any particular country because any particular country can make junk or good stuff. It just depends on who's making it and what you're paying for it. But this is named after the discoverer of using throwing manpower and cheap uh, materials at a problem. What you end up with is Chinesium, which is great for, for dicking around. But if and you're specking something out for an industrial application, uh, you really don't want to be using Chinesium because you're not going to be... First off, you don't know if you'll ever be able to mine this stuff again. In 10 years, you need a new one of these. Are you going to be able to find it? Are they still going to be around? That's kind of where, you know, people don't get fired for, for buying IBM. People don't get fired for buying Caterpillar haul trucks. <laughs> you know where you're going to get parts. Speaking of parts, there is a commonality here. There's a standard. Now, this is be, well, the Vickers uh, vein pump patents ran out probably 100 years ago. So this would be a metric knockoff. But... All you would need to do if you saw one of these and there was no uh, name tag or it was it was straight up Chinesium and you just couldn't find the Jesus thing. You can always measure the this spigot size here, the size of the shaft and the bolt hole pattern and you get get yourself pretty damn close to what you need. Of course, you would need to figure out which direction this is going to turn as well, whether it's clockwise or anti-clockwise. You can see here they've helped us out. Huh? Huh? Yeah, my wife doesn't think I'm funny either. You would have to finger out internally, okay, how do I get from in to out, which direction is, is the internal veins moving in order to do that? You just got to take a couple of seconds and figure that out. But they are an industrial Lego, right? I mean, depending on the granularity you're looking at, everything is industrial Lego, but that's... Uh, for a future kindergarten engineering with jail. Here we go. Release the schmoo. 
Now, if you can hear that, Brother Bear ain't too happy about that. He just had his uh, year shots. Yeah, vaccinations. <laughs> uh, fucking polio. Am I right? Am I right? I, yeah. The mind boggles. Have you ever been to a third world shithole where kids are dying of fucking measles or shit? Like, get your fucking head out of your ass, parents. I can't. I can't. Anyway. Okay. Here we go. Bunch of stuff in there. Everybody's favorite when giving a horse looking at the teeth. We're going through the internals. And we see on the cap end here, we have some porting to take any bypass flow what sneaks through this DU bushing. This is a special kind of bushing, very uh, light sleeve, but then they Teflon that. So it's, I think it's Teflon and then a bit of bronze and then aluminum. And it just gets pounded in there. And that's the bearing itself, of course, lubricated by the hydraulic oil, non-pressure oil, it'd be pressurized in here. And then anything that leaked through would go back to the input side. So low pressure on the inlet side, right? Same thing on this plate that uh, keeps everything together. Some O-rings and some offset O-rings where you can see same thing. Some porting here to take any bypass flow, anything that's leaked past any of the seals to go and port it back to the inlet, the low pressure side. So we always port from the high pressure side in case there's, a, there's some sort of leak. And then we allow that to go back to the inlet side. Now here's where the magic happens. These are the veins and you'll note these are steel veins and no intervein on there. They're quite small, quite thin, and they're, they're steel. I believe they'd be hardened. Uh, they might not be, but if I have my calibrated hardness tester here. Yeah, hard as a coffin nail. And that sits inside of this ring. And this ring has been lapped very nicely. It's, um, yeah. Despite being complete and utter Chineseium and being cheap as chips, the thing's a beautiful bit of kit considering all things, like, ain't nothing wrong with it, quite frankly. Okay, so that sits in there like that. This guy's spinning my things. It picks up oil from the low pressure side pumps it over to the high pressure side. Now the way it changes the amount of flow, its displacement, is pressure back feeds onto this piston, huh? here, it'd be all sealed up, and this bears on the outer ring. You see how thick that outer ring is? This bears on the outer ring and moves this guy around. Of course, these little veins here, they pop out under pressure. Now, normally, these veins in a bigger Vickers pump are micarta. They're phenolic resin, and they have an intervein. What the intervein does, it's a little cutout in here. You'll see um, it, it has a little slot, and then the whole thing is cut out. What that does is it reduces the amount of sealing force. It reduces the amount of force. Of course, uh, pressure equals area times force. So if you have a certain amount of area and a certain amount of pressure, you get a certain amount of force. That force is too much on those micarta ones, and you need an intervene to reduce the effective area. So instead of having this whole area uh, as an effective area where hydraulic pressure is bearing on it, you make a cut out there, and then you're only getting an effective area of you know two little thumbnails worth on the very tippy tops. So I think because these are hardened steel and they're very much thinner, we can get away without having an intervene. Here's the pressure compensator. You can see the size of that die spring, big, heavy spring. Uh, this is the control piston here. Well, this is the control, I guess that'd be spring seat that allows this adjustment nut to bear on there and put more or less pressure on that. So that fits in here like so. Here's the inlet, the inlet gallery, outlet gallery. This is the manifold. Now this is different than a gear pump in that the oil manifold is not um, radial. It's not radial to the pumping element. It's axial to the pumping element. You can see it comes up and out and back down. 
the spring applies force with or without the hydraulics working. So let's consider that there's zero hydraulics um, pressure because the thing hasn't turned in a while. Okay, so that means that this is bearing on the ring. The ring is hard up against this stop. Now, as pressure builds up, pressure builds up in the case, bears against this piston, counteracts the force of the spring, and the ring moves, and the ring moves up. That is the difference between full stroke and no stroke. Of course, this into this rotor is turning and the veins are, are popping in and out eccentrically uh, while it's rotating inside this eccentric ring. They're, they're reciprocating rather, but they're riding up against there and then all of the mating surfaces are being sealed by the oil itself. The, so this kind of pump is pretty good uh, at having dirt in it. It's not as good as a, a gear pump. I mean, a gear pump, essentially bulletproof, but far better than a piston pump. So for dirty applications, you never want dirt in your hydraulic oil, but for cheap and dirty with pressure compensation, this is the way to go. I mean, 73 doll hairs. Now it's good practice with any hydraulic pump to fill them with oil beforehand, even though, you know, it's unfiltered, yada, yada. There's different, yeah, yeah, manufacturers say different things, but especially good to get in the habit of filling the case with good, clean oil straight out of the can for a piston pump. Many a piston pump has been blown up by somebody carelessly putting it in a system and not pre-lubing it. So in this case, if you don't pre-lube it, what could happen is there's not enough pressure internally and not enough fling out internally to get these little veins to fling out and seat. And the same thing as uh, a worn out uh, dug a dug a gun. Once it gets worn out and there's too much bypass in there, it doesn't want to seat properly because those little uh, inter those veins don't fly out. So what do you do? Uh, you fill it full of WD-40 and WD-40 is a non-compressible fluid, so you can't compress it. When you get a little compression in there, it flies out and seals everything up, and then the, the gun works like a hot damn until you know you run out of WD-40, and then it doesn't work for shit again. So if there's a maintenance issue on one of these guys, and there, there's a case where it's not uh, pumping at all, uh, very likely you take it apart, you put it back together, and it majestically works, just magic-like. Chances are it was the veins were unseated. So before you take it all apart, you might want to give it a try. Just stick a little air in there, give her a chotch, and that might pop those veins out and get her to work again. Uh, also, when in doubt, eh, give it a clout. That might work too. You never know. Oh, thanks for joining me in the shop for a gurgle and a chuckle and a, a little poke at some industrial... Well, ubiquitous industrial awesomeness, hydraulics. Is there anything it can't do? Thanks for watching. Keep your clam on a clamp.